My name is Derek Talbot. I've been teaching anatomy here at Roslyn Franklin University of Medicine and Science for about 15 years. I teach in the um, neuroscience or neuroanatomy course. I also teach in the clinical anatomy course, the lower extremity anatomy course, and then final, finally the microscopic anatomy course. And I am also a part-time uh, chiropractor. So my interest is mainly um, anatomy education, uh, interprofessional education. So a little background, most of us already know this, but um, the most common cited goal for um, interprofessional education is really to develop and enhance um, teamwork skills. Um, and IPE will offer an opportunity for these students to do that, to develop the knowledge and the skills mainly to work um, in teams and the ability to practice collaboratively and also to um, eventually, hopefully this will translate into enhanced service delivery. Now, my main interest, of course, being uh, learning anatomy in an IP environment, actually um, stems from the definition that we see most often for IP, which is interprofessional education, is defined as students from two or more healthcare professions learning with and from and about one another. And I really want to kind of more directly measure um, if IPE will enhance the uh, learning with and from one another. So why is this kind of study important? Well, um, first of all, anytime you introduce any new aspect of health profession education, like IPE, it's rather new, um, I believe, and some other authors agree with me, that it should require some evaluation to see if it shows any effectiveness. When I first started teaching here in the um, interprofessional education environment, to me I thought it was just a cheap way for the university to have a bunch of students take anatomy from different professions. You just use uh, several professors and instead of having them take several different classes, just group them all in one class. Well, as time has gone on, I believe this could be an effective strategy uh, for learning not only anatomy but other basic and clinical sciences. But in any case, there has been very little studies done, and these studies need to be done to inform the educational development and to influence and determine future educational practices. What I'm about to show you is that there's very a limited amount of st uh, number of studies that even evaluate the effectiveness of interprofessional education uh, translating into knowledge and into skills, which is very important. So anatomy being, you know, part clinician and part um, anatomist, to me is very important. Of course, um, I believe it, um, and others believe that it is the foundation. It supports the examination of the patient. It helps in formulating a diagnosis. And most importantly, everyone's got to be on the same page when communicating these findings, not only to the patient, but to between peers and other healthcare professionals. Out of all the basic sciences, um, I believe, and others too, that it provides a platform and knowledge suitable um, for all healthcare professions. Here at Roslyn Franklin, most all healthcare professions. Uh, students are required to take an anatomy course, um, some at different levels, but most of them are pretty intense. And this is a quote from uh, Dr. Uh, um, Turney. He says, the ability to accurately and successfully communicate anatomical structures is of extreme importance for public safety, and I 100% agree with that. So what do we know about IPE and learning? Well, I didn't do a exhaustive uh, search, but I did a pretty thorough search, and I found a great article by Kathleen Gillan. Um, she was in the same search that I was. She, she looked to evaluate the um, efforts uh, that we see out there that are evaluating IP initiatives. So she did a large literature review. She identified 136 interprofessional education studies. Within those studies, there was 33 measurement tools that she found, 
and when she broke the measurement tools down, which were all surveys, she found 538 survey items. Now here's where it gets interesting. Of the 538 survey items, 68% assess changes in the student's perception of IP, and 21% assess um, the learner's reaction to IPE. So 89% of the uh, studies, the tools that are used, are assessing pretty much the student's opinion of IP. Now, these surveys are objective measures, but they're more um, of a student's opinion. They're more what we call an indirect measure. Our more direct measures, where we actually look at uh, change in a person's behavior, or where they acquire knowledge or skills, that's only about 10% of the studies out there. Now this article is from 2011, so there could be um, more of this going on, but definitely the bulk of the studies are in uh, mainly the student's opinion of perception and then their reaction. So of the uh, 538 items, only seven of them uh, represented um, the acquisition of skills and knowledge, and all of them were more open-ended questioning uh, qualitative elements. So what do we know about anatomy IP? Well, there's actually, it has been studied. In fact, a lot of authors feel that the cadaver can simulate kind of the first uh, patient. This is the first encounter and the, the first time where the um, uh, different professionals will work as a team. So there was five anatomical IP studies that I identified. Uh, I put down here most measured the student's perception and reaction of IP. Actually, all of them did. Uh, Fernandez did not only a, um, a survey, but he also did a qualitative study. And he asked um, all the students through a focus group interviews uh, and they all agreed that IP did enhance learning anatomy. Again, this is opinion. Overall, the five studies did show a high degree of satisfaction, which is important. We don't want the students doing something they don't want to do. Um, they desired more of this type of interaction. And like I said, they found an effective approach to learning anatomy. So my theoretical foundation for this study, uh, it's an older learning theory. Vygotsky's social cultural theory. Really central to his theory, and what I really want to talk to you about is his zone of proximal development. This, I think, divides the best framework for understanding the relationship between IP and content based learning. And I'm going to go through it with you real quick. The zone of proximal development, uh, Vygotsky's zone of proximal development is essentially the student, he feels the student's cognitive growth is going to be bounded at the lower end by what the students themselves can do on their own and accomplish on their own. But when you put them in a situation where they are um, paired up with a more knowledgeable other, like a teacher or peers, um, then they can actually reach a higher zone of uh, d development. They could go through um, a lower zone to a higher zone by being with a more knowledgeable um, other. Now, this doesn't mean with if you're in an IPE group, there's one student there um, that's more knowledgeable than the rest. Basically, what this means is there'll be a situation where one student in a group will be more knowledgeable about a certain uh, area or topic. And then in a different situation, we'll have a different student that is more knowledgeable in that particular topic. And that's why I believe for IPE, this is well suited because we have people coming from a vast amount of different backgrounds and they'll all be having somewhat different educational experiences. Uh, Marcel Dion uh, provides probably the most comprehensive plan that I've seen out there for utilizing Vygotsky's uh, social cultural learning theory in IPE. He actually well maps out a blueprint for interprofessional learning. And instead of calling them zones of proximal development, Dion uh, calls it scaffolding. He calls a scaffold uh, will take the form of a more knowledgeable student 
or he even goes further talks about cultural resources like case studies external to the learner and these will kind of support the learner until they've kind of mastered that concept and the scaffold is very temporarily once a student understands the concept they'll no longer be need that scaffold but then they'll be reaching higher and higher scaffolds and his theory is that if we increase the student's complexity of their environment by getting them different professionals working together in teams and harder and harder and more complex cases that um, the student's um, learning process will be enhanced. So my study is, um, the setting is in our neuroscience course here at Roslyn Franklin. The participants will be around 90 so pediatric students, around 90 physical therapy students, and then I think there's about 25 path assistant students. All of them will be included in the study. This will be a randomized controlled trial. The students will be randomized into one of the following groups. Group A, of course, are in a professional group. Group B will be a year professional group, and then we'll compare this to group C, which they'll be doing the activities solo. Um, the reason I have interprofessional and professional because there's a lot of studies out there that are showing that cooperative learning, uh, group studying, and group learning actually does seem to um, uh, perform better than solo learning. Uh, and these were tested with direct measures, which I'll talk about in a second. So I want to see, and I believe interprofessional learning would be better than your professional because interprofessional learning you're going to have a case study and you have a situation, let's say where you had some lower extremity thing, you might have the path, uh, I'm sorry, the PT and the podiatrist might have more knowledge of the anatomy in that area, but if they're paired with a pharmacy student, he might have more knowledge of any drug that might interact in that area or any physiolo physiologic um, uh, responses that are happening in the area. So the more vast or complex the environment, the greater capacity um, for learning. So this study will be what we call a crossover study. That means each student will participate once in the interprofessional group, they'll participate once in a year professional group, and then once in a solo group. There'll be three separate interactions. In each interaction, there'll be multiple case studies, like probably two to three case studies. Interaction one, I'll focus mainly on spinal cord, uh, sensory spinal cord lesions. Uh, interaction two will be motor spinal cord lesions. And then interaction three will be central nervous system lesions. So every student will participate in each interaction, but under a different group setting. So for example, Derek might interact in, um, might be in interaction one solo, and then I'll be in interaction two uh, in unit professional and in interaction three as interprofessional. This will be randomized. So what are my measurements? Well, each student will be given a pretest and a post-test for each interaction. Pretest and post-test for interaction one, and then another one for two and three. And as we know of, the best way to um, determine knowledge acquisition is through a pre and post testing. Also, um, these case studies will end with a multiple choice uh, test that will be graded, so they'll get a, uh, a team grade. It's kind of like name the lesion. They have to, as a team, identify the name of the lesion or the where the lesion is on this particular patient. So they will not have to know. I know they're first year students, so they'll not have to know a lot of clinical knowledge. Basically, in neuroanatomy, um, you have to know a lot of neur uh, neuroanatomy, the actual anatomy knowledge, to figure out the diagnosis. So they will not need a lot of clinical knowledge. But I like the fact, in real life, they have a common goal to help the patient. So they need a common goal. And the goal here is to identify the lesion. And they need this goal so they um, will potentially work as a team in figuring out the goal. Okay, 
So I will do some reliability and validity testing on all the tests that will, I will administer. I'll do my content validity uh, testing by, I'll have um, experts at Rosalind Franklin look at the questions and make sure that there's a good match rate. Dr. Manning and Dr. Grummet, I singled out to do this. And they'll make sure that they both agree that each item or question um, is testing what it's supposed to test. Reliability of that may be using that correlation uh, based on uh, between the scale. We'll split the uh, scale in half and look to see how well it correlates. And then we'll look for stability by doing a test retest method. I think some of the tests I might have some of the second year students take it in a month later retake and see how uh, stable it is. So there are two types of analysis. We'll do a group analysis. We'll take the pre and post test differences and we'll compare them between the three different groups, interprofessional, uniprofessional, and solo, and see if the interprofessional group uh, outperformed the other two groups. Also, we'll look at the case studies multiple choice test and we'll compare those between the uh, three groups. Finally, what we'll do is an individual analysis. We'll teach each student, because each student now has gone through each interaction, or um, yeah, each interaction. Uh, so three different interactions in three different group settings. They had one interaction as IPE, one interaction as a year professional, and one interaction as a solo um, practitioner. So we'll compare them and we'll see how well they performed in each one of those environments. So why did I like this sort of method? Well, one reason I already talked about, there's little bit, very little testing in the acquisition of knowledge and skills. Um, also, I feel like when we make such a change into health professions education, like introducing IPE, we have to show th its effectiveness. And I think we need, in IP, in my personal opinion, we need more direct measures. Direct measures will assess achievement. In our case, we're looking at anatomical knowledge acquisition uh, by observation of performance. And like I showed you earlier, this represents a very small portion of the current studies, almost non-existent. Most studies are soliciting opinion. And this should be compared to uh, what we call an indirect measure, someone's opinion of whether they, they learn the material or so forth. And this does represent a very large portion. So I want to thank you.